Well, uh, the title of my presentation is Low Power Nano Biophotonic Computing with Photochromic Protein Coated Ultra High Q Micro Resonators. Now, let me first present the outline. Uh, I will first delve on the motivation of our work and then what are, have been our objectives. Then I'll focus on all optical switching in photochromic proteins and how one can integrate the proteins with ultra high Q micro resonators to have more efficient and low power switching. And then how does that compare with other organic molecules which are uh, being researched recently? And then how we can use the switching, basic switch for applications in non-optical biomolecular computing and then finally make a conclusion. Now you see we are in the information age and information forms the basis of modern technology. So the basic requirement for information is that you have to have high bandwidth, high speed, good reliability, small size and cost. And the fact is that the technology which, is, which has the promise of fulfilling a future needs is photonics. Now photonics has made an impact on these four key areas of information processing. So you can acquire information through optical sensors and scanners, you can transmit information through optical fibers with erbium door fiber amplifiers, with repeaterless you know, uh, communication. You can process information with optical integrated circuits, much like the VLSI circuits, and you can store data in optical disks and holographic memories. Now, if one looks at these two aspects of com compute information processing, you have computing and communication. In computing, we follow the top-down approach, and that is the conventional VLSI technology. And people are anticipating that, of course, there would be a limitation very soon, and what exactly can be an alternative to silicon. Now, there are four interesting strategies the optical computing has been there for a while. DNA as a basic building block of computing systems. How can one use a single molecule and then find two stable states of operation so that one can have digital binary implementation? And of course, the exotic quantum computing uh, exploiting the quantum states of electrons or nuclei. Now, the important point is whatever you look at, optical implementation has advantages. And any technology which is going to come up has to be compatible with fiber optic communication. The other important point is, can there be a hybrid approach? So can we have a platform where we can integrate these you know, strategies together, one or two or three or all of them? And the fact is, so for example, can I find a photosensitive molecule which I can manipulate optically and therefore have an optical molecular implementation? So that's a very interesting proposition. Now optical computing has been there for a while and uh, there, there are several criteria which one has to satisfy like cascadability, fan out, logic level restoration, input output isolation, absence of critical biasing and logic level independent of loss. But the fact is that it has many advantages. High speed, high bandwidth, higher interconnection densities, lower crosstalk, inherent parallelism in spatial and temporal domain, higher fan in and fan out capability, immunity to electromagnetic interference and ground loops using fiber optics, Energy consumption and heat dissipation are very important factors which are going to be important for optical computing in the future. And a very important aspect is, instead of Boolean irreversible logic, can we design conservative and reversible logic circuits and have this energy cons consumption and heat dissipation uh, factors incorporated into uh, future computing systems. So therefore, one has to look into all optical computing. So more and more functions can I perform in the optical domain itself. Now, if one looks at communication, you have the standard fiber optic communication. The problem is that both the speed and the bandwidth are limited by the optics to electronics interconversion which takes place at the transmitter and the receiver end. So the fact is, can one again look at all optical communication or, or replace these circuits here at the two ends by optical all optical circuits. So the present challenge in information processing seems to be in all optical information processing. Now the problem is you need to have therefore absolute optical control over various features of light. So generation, transmission, switching, modulation, amplification, frequency conversion, detection, these are what I need for you know, having an all optical information processing system. So this has to deal with this magical capability of controlling light with light. And that can only be possible through the principles of nonlinear optics. Now, nonlinear optics is very well established branch of physics, but there have been practical limitations in terms of materials. You need high nonlinearity so that at low powers you can see nonlinear effects, fast response of the material, high efficiency, stability. It has to be photo and thermal stable. 
cost effective, again, is a very important criteria because most of the nonlinear crystals which we use are very expensive. Now, there have been a range of materials which are still being studied and have been studied over the decades. Primarily, liquid crystals, semiconductor doped glasses, organometallics, organic dyes and polymers, fullerenes, graphene has emerged recently. But an interesting proposition is biomaterials. Can we have a biomaterial for non-linear non optical implementation or application? Now, that would be very interesting because that would help us in understanding natural information processing. It would be a cost-effective technology if we can harness these biomaterials from nature environmentally safe technology, and of course, you can tailor their response by using the powerful capabilities of biotechnology. And of course, with nanotech, again, one can tailor the molecular uh, nonlinear response, and therefore, one can have, uh, one can design new molecular configurations. So therefore, this leads to a very niche area, which is at the intersection of the three model first, first areas which we have these days, and that is the integration of nanotechnology, biotechnology, and photonics, which is information technology. So this has led to the emergence of this area of nanobiophotonics. Now you see, light sustains life on Earth. So if you look around your cells, you find that all activities are controlled by light. If you look at the activity which goes on uh, around us on, our, on this planet, you find that we have the land mass, and the water mass, right? So if you look at the activity, you have the vegetation, you have plants which have a tendency to grow towards light. Now in molecular biology, people have been able to isolate these ultra-sensitive proteins, photoreceptors, which trigger this response and control it. Similarly, you have flowers which bloom in the morning and they close in the evening. So it's a very amazing optomechanical you know, activity which takes place around us. So the question is, what exactly triggers this response? There are very sensitive photoreceptor proteins which have been isolated, characterized very recently. And if you look at the, the, the water body, you have the salt marshes, you have bacteria, you have algae, and if you go down into the depths of the ocean, you have exotic life forms which sustain themselves, and in fact their existence exists, uh, existence uh, depends upon their ability to sense light, all right, and even uh, act as predators to eat or survive. So therefore, there is a lot of activity around us which depends upon light. So if you look at these natural photoreceptors, you find that they are abundantly found throughout the plant and animal kingdom. They have been optimized naturally through centuries of evolution. They exhibit a unique photoreaction behavior, and they exhibit an efficient photoresponse at very low light intensity levels. Now we have the ability to perform purified samples with excellent properties. We can modify these properties, and of course they are environmentally friendly. Now one such material which comes to mind immediately, which is what we use for our own survival, is the human retina. So if you find, you, you, we, we know that in, even in a very dark room, we are able to perceive objects, and so therefore it's a very, very sensitive material, which exactly is a protein in the retina, which is called the rhodopsin protein. But the fact is we can't have this for device application. But interestingly, this rhodopsin is a very big, huge extended family. And you find that people have been able to characterize the, the rhodopsin family into two categories, visual rhodopsins and archaeal rhodopsins. Now these archaeal rhodopsins are spread over different uh, you know, systems, right from salt flats to fungal pathogens, and they comprise a broad phylogenetic range of microbial life and nearly 800 relatives have been identified in world's oceans at different depths, right? Because each, uh, at different depths, different amount of sunlight reaches uh, the, um, the uh, rhodopsin proteins, and therefore they have adapted to those ambient light conditions. So if one looks at the evolution of life, you find that archaea bacteria are the oldest life forms which have resulted in, you know, the evolution of life. So there are more than 3,500 million years right, old, and so therefore they have adapted to different, different um, you know, uh, environmental conditions. One of the most important and outstanding material which has been discovered and is the subject of intense research is bacteriorhodopsin, because the bacteria grows this in salt marshes, right, so you find this is a, a, an aerial picture of Owens Lake in California, and you have a purple membrane on the surface of the salt marsh. And if you, you know, what happens is that when the sunlight fails to reach the the bacteria, it 
tends to die. And in order to survive, it nips the purple membrane and survives. And what people have now understood is that it converts sunlight to chemical energy, which is photosynthesis. And it's the second known system in the world besides chlorophylls, which performs this amazing life-sustaining task of you know, converting or storing light energy. And if you synthesize this purple membrane, you find that it's a similar rhodopsin protein-like uh, material, which is called bacterial rhodopsin. It was discovered in 1971, and it is a model system to understand signal transduction pathways, right? And you have a very interesting photoresponse of this material. Let us look at this protein molecule and see how exactly does it respond to light. Now what happens is it has a peak sensitivity at 570 green yellow wavelength region. And once a photon comes in, it absorbs this photon and undergoes conformational transitions and relaxes back to its original state. Now a very interesting fact is that if at under certain conditions, you shine a red light, it goes into a state where it stays for infinite time, and it's a very stable state. But if you shine a blue light, you can relax it back to the original state. So this is a protein molecule which inherently shows two stable states of operation. So one can designate this as a zero and this as a one, and it, it, it can be used for reading, writing, and erasing data with a, with a protein like this. An interesting aspect also is the fact that if you shine light at any of these wavelengths, you can switch or truncate the conformational transitions of this protein and make it come back to the initial ground state. So this gives you a lot of flexibility uh, of you know, designing different kinds of devices because you have the entire vis visible spectrum to play with. Now this is the absorption spectrum and you can see the peak absorption at 570 but it has in the native state a uh, broad uh, you know, absorption spectrum, and these are the absorption spectra of the excited states, and you can see that there's a 160 nanometer shift between the ground state and the M state, this M state, which is a blue sensitive state. Now, this shows uh, the change in the conformation of the molecule when it absorbs a photon, and this shows the comparison between the wild type, which is you know, existing in nature in the natural form, and a mutant where uh, one amino acid has been re replaced at the position D96N. And you can see that this part of the photocycle is absent. So you just go from the N state, these, these, this is not existing here. So the idea is that with mutants and variants, you can tailor the photoresponse for certain device applications. Now this simple photocycle is nothing but an implementation of an AND gate. So the fact is that if green light is only sh you know, uh, incident on this molecule, it absorbs and comes back to the original state, so the output is zero. But if you, and if you shine a red light, it again absorbs and comes back. It absorbs a little less than 570, but it has an absorption band at 640. So again, the output is zero. But if you shine both, the, both of them together, it goes into a, this PQ state, which is a high state, and therefore, the output is one. And of course, you can erase this by shining the entire thing with blue light. Now there are several advantages and properties of unique properties of bacterial rhodopsin, which really make it very, very interesting material for nonlinear optical applications. For example, it has a very efficient photochemistry. For example, it absorbs more than 65% of light which is incident on it. There's a large change in refractive index of the order of 0 0.01, depending upon the optical density, large shift in the absorption spectra, reversible transitions in the photocycle, Important, the most important thing is stability, photostability. So how stable is it? Amazingly, since it survives in very robust, harsh conditions, it is stable to a temperature of 140 degrees centigrade, right? And over a very wide range of pH values, right from zero to 12, and even after shining a million laser beams through it, it has not shown any, experimentally it has been shown that it has not shown any degradation in its properties. And of course you can tailor the properties by different techniques and of course it's environmentally friendly. It's a smart material because it exhibits three very important functions. It's photochromic, number one. It shows a photoelectric response and it also acts like a phototransporting system. So it pumps a proton, which is a very, very powerful capability. You can displace an electron, that's easy, but pumping a proton is very tough and it acts like a proton pump, and this therefore has resulted in large number of applications. So if you look at the optical properties of bacterial rhodopsin, you find that there are very interesting ones. For example, the index of refraction can be tailored from 1.44 to 1.55, the 
change in the refractive index. It has the largest two photon absorption cross section reported for any material, 10 to the power 6 in suspensions, and 1,000 times more for any organic material. It has an aperture size which is almost unlimited. So you can fabricate a film as large as the screen, and you can you know, use it for displays or recording or something like that. Now, not just bacteriorhodopsin. There are several other proteins which people have discovered uh, <coughs> in nature. For example, this is uh, what shows you the photo response of another interesting sensory rhodopsin 2 protein, which is called Peronis hoborhodopsin. A very interesting thing is that it's blue shifted, which is very important for memory applications, because if you use blue light, you, ca you can pack more amount of information in onto the same surface. Similarly, here you have this response of proteorhodopsin, again, a very recently discovered protein, and this is the absorption spectra. Another interesting system is the photoactive yellow protein, and again, you find that it has a similar conformational transitions taking place, and therefore, there's a photocycle, and it's again a blue sensitive protein in its, in its native state. And if you look at sensory photoreceptors in plants, people have discovered different kinds of receptors three main families, phototrophins, cytochromes, and cryptochromes, which are in, you know, sensitive in different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. And they participate in different important activities. For example, flowering, germination, deetiolation, shade avoidance, chloroplast movement, circadian entrainment. So the question is, when does the tree know that the fruit has to come, all right? So there has to be somebody which has to take that decision. So these are the, uh, the Photo, natural photoreceptors, which essentially play this role and trigger or control the response. One of the interesting proteins which has been isolated from uh, oats is the Love2 phototropin. It has this absorption spectrum, and you can see that over a wide range, the excited state absorption coefficient is much larger than the ground state, which leads to uh, the reverse saturable absorption with a high contrast. And it's just a simpler photocycle. So you have a blue shifted, uh, you know, blue sensitive. Uh, protein in the native state, and you can see that it has a faster photocycle in the initial state than the other proteins. Similarly, we have chlorophyll A, which we all uh, are very familiar with. The question is, can these natural photoreceptors be used for information processing? Now, there have been several applications which have been proposed with bacterial rhodopsin only, and there have been charge transport, so important ones like desalination of seawater, can you design an artificial retina because blindness has no cure to date, Photochromic properties have, have been mainly used for information processing, right from you know, phase conjugation to bistability to image processing to slow and fast light. In fact, ultra-slow light was demonstrated in 2005 uh, to a value of 0 0.091 millimeters per second because there's a large change in the refractive index and absorption at the resonance condition, and of course, other applications. This is a schematic of the optoelectronic eye uh, uh, design where VR has been proposed to be used uh, as a photo, bio photo receiver. This is a three-dimensional memory implementation, which was reported in 2002, where you have this VR protein in a cuvette in a gel, and by having different laser arrays, green and red, you can make it go into the P state, and then when shining blue light, you can erase the data. And this is a prototype which been shown to work along with a conventional computer, electronic computer, using VR in this cuvette in 2002. So there have been applications which people have been looking at for a long time, but we've been looking into the information processing aspect. So this is again a, uh, a graph which shows you the comparison of the photoelectric response in VR dried purple films. Now our objectives have been to look into the nonlinear optical response of these photochromic proteins. How can one optimize these, this photo response? And how does it compare with other organic molecules? And then how can one study all optical switching and then design low power all optical biomolecular computing devices. Now, a switch is the basic building block of information processing systems. So one should have an efficient design of a switch. So what we've been looking at is the simplest design, and that is you use a CW or a pump pulse laser beam to excite the protein, make it undergo the excited state conformational transitions, the photocycle, and then probe it with a probe laser beam. So this is the standard pump probe spectroscopic arrangement, but the fact is that you have, you're using only two light beams, nothing else, no focusing geometry, and you can try to control one light beam with another by the phenomenon of excited state absorption. So there are two cases in this. One is that you have a CW uh, 
uh, beam, both beams being CW. So by changing the intensity of the pump beam, you can control the transmission of the probe beam. And the other is if you use a pulse here to excite, and so if you use the green light for exciting that BR protein, and you have a red laser beam, then initially the output is high, but as soon as the pulse comes in, it goes into an excited state which absorbs the red light. So therefore, there's a dip in the transmission at the output, so you have a switch, inverter switch. Now, first of all, we formulated a, an accurate theoretical model because that's what would lead to the uh, comparison with experiments. So one can use the rate equation approach, write down the the absorption coefficient for multiple modulation beams, and we've been able to come up with a very exact multiple beam absorption coefficient, right, which is exact, general, and this is an analytical expression, accurate, which takes into account all kinds of transition, quantum efficiencies, and it's a nonlinear function of the intense modulating intensities. So one can put it in a very compact form. Now, with this, then one can look at the transmission of different wavelengths and how the response would take place uh, when they pass through this protein film or a protein sample. These are some results here for CW modulation. So you can see that an intensity of microwatts per centimeter square, you can have a modulation of a blue light with a green light passing through the sample. These are some experimental graphs for the blue shifted protein. And you can have a 50% modulation of the transmission, normalized transmission of the probe intensity and one can work out the optimum concentration, et cetera. Similarly, by changing the pH value, one can you know, control the switching contrast and switching uh, transmissions of the uh, probe beam. And one can, if one looks at a threshold logic, one can implement an XOR logic gate by using two beams, CW beams, uh, you know, using the same, the, the, the same setup. Similarly, you have different excited states if in, in the photo cycle, and one can then study how exactly would the modulation take place and change. So here we have a very high modulation of 512 with a 498 beam for the blue protein that is PPR. So we've done a very extensive analysis of this, and this leads to the implementation of computing circuits. So for example, if we have this protein film here, and we pass multiple beams through different parts of this film, and excited by the green yellow light at 570 nanometer, we can design different kinds of logic gates in parallel by choosing threshold, suitable threshold, and the parts of this curve. So by using different intensities of laser beams, one can design parallel logic gates, OR and XOR, NOR, NAND together. And similarly, if one has a common threshold, one can again implement it with bacterial rhodopsin in this manner, which we had reported some time back. Now, if one looks at pulse excitation, we can then study the re response of different pulse widths or you know, intensities onto the switching characteristics. So the lifetime of the excited state is an important factor because it is going to give you a dip or a hump whether the population builds up or it doesn't. So that one can explain all this through the population dynamics and one can study the effect of different parameters, right, intensity, et cetera. But an interesting point is, that for cascading, I need to have a strong probe beam. So therefore, I need to take into account the absorption due to the probe beam as well. And interestingly, we've shown that if you have a weak probe beam or, an, or, or a strong probe beam, you can change the phase of the switching uh, characteristics. So one can have a hump or a dip by just controlling the probe intensity. So that, again, is a very important factor for uh, switching applications. Now, if one has multiple pulses passing through the same sample, one can design different input, multiple input logic gates. So this is what we've done. The simple pulse gives you a dip, so it's a not gate, but if you use multiple pulses, pulse trains, if the lifetime of the excited state is less, then the intensity, when it increases, is going to give me a larger transmission, or a bigger hump. So this corresponds to an all optical or an AND logic gate. And similarly, if the lifetime is high so that the population builds up, it's going to give me a dip. And so therefore, one can implement the universal NOR and NAND logic gates by just using a protein and a very low power uh, pulses. This is the effect of the pulse strain. So one can study how the relaxation takes place as multiple pulses come in at different frequencies. This is the experiment and theoretical comparison. So you can see that one can theoretically model very accurately the experimental variations and they're in very good agreement. So you have the pulse strain, the pump pulse, and the transmitted 
uh, response, which is totally out of phase. Now, we've done, again, a very interesting study with, the, with this new protein, PPR, and you can see that the experiment and theory, again, uh, are in very good agreement. Mm -hmm. And important thing is that when you change the frequency, you can see that the pulse profile also changes. So you can control the switching profile by changing or controlling the frequency of these pulses. Similarly, at different wavelengths, you can see that you have a triangular response or a sinusoidal response. So again, theory and experiment are in very good agreement. Now, these are the switching characteristics for the LOVE2 plant-based phototropin. And you can see that you can have high contrast at microsecond switching response. And there's a mutant here, which does away with the third intermediate state as well. So you just have a two-state model and two-state response, and one can, you know, trigger this response and get faster switching. This is, these are the switching uh, results for chlorophyll. So you can see that a combination of different wavelengths can give me a very high contrast. So if I use, let's say, 672 and 476, a red and a blue beam, then I can have as high as 97.5% with chlorophyll A uh, isolated from spinach leaves. This is, again, a ex ex comparison between theory and experiment <coughs> of uh, chlorophyll A, and you can see that, again, there's a very good agreement. These are the switching characteristics for the photoactive yellow protein, and uh, you can see that you can have sub-microsecond switching response here. So if you compare the natural photoreceptors, switching in natural photoreceptors with uh, the organic materials which people ha are using, right, or are interested in, you can find that it compares well. So you can have microsecond to millisecond, and you can have nanosecond, and, of course, faster response, but there's a trade-off that a faster response re requires much higher intensity. So one can also do that with these natural photoreceptors, but the idea is to use as low power as possible. Now, an important proposition is, can I enhance the switching by integrating it, the proteins, with a sensitive micro or a nanostructure? Now, these micro nanostructures are very, very uh, important these days. People have been, are working on photonic crystals or Fabry-Ferro geometries, resonator circuits, which have ultra high quality factor. So that makes them very, very sensitive. Now, there have been micro toroids and different kinds of, you know, applications which people have proposed with these micro resonators. But we've been focusing on silica microsphere resonators. Now, it has, they, they have a number of advantages. High quality factor, simple fabrication, you can have on-chip integration, and you can control the coupling efficiency by change of the optical fiber thickness. So what you have is the following, that we have here this system, that we have an optical fiber, which is here, and you have the laser diode, which is a, 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 a diode which scans the wavelength over a certain range. You have a detector here. There's a taper which is formed right in the middle, and there's a microsphere, a silica microsphere, which is in contact with that tapered region. So therefore, when light passes through this, uh, this fiber, it excites whispering gallery modes around this microsphere. And this whispering gallery modes, there are different modes, or so therefore, when you look at the transmission with wavelength, you find that there is a dip at the certain specific wavelengths, which couple through or satisfy the resonance condition. And a single impurity, if it comes onto the circumference, is enough to to shift this wavelength. And the shift can be very uh, easily measured, and therefore one can find out what exactly was that caused this shift. So therefore, these have been very, very popular, and they are being, uh, you know, uh, they are subject of intense research uh, these days. And the fact is, can one use the bacteriorhodoxin protein integrated with these microspheres, and therefore have a device application? Now these have been used for proposed to be useful for single molecule detection. They have the capability for protein binding, DNA, membrane, mass spectroscopy, virus detection, and cell detection. Now, what we have done is we fabricated a microsphere, silica microsphere, through a single mode fiber tip, and deposited this bacteriodotoxin film layer by layer, right? So we fabricated three uh, monolayers of this retinal VR film and therefore studied this, 
the, the the coupling or the resonance condition with respect to different modes, this TE or TM modes. And this is again a very novel way of studying the protein binding at the microsphere. Now one finds that if you have two tapers alongside, what happens, what one can do is, one can pass a near infrared wavelength and that gets coupled and comes onto port three. But suppose you have a bacteriorhodopsin film on top which is sensitive to green light. If you shine a pulse of this light onto this protein, it is going to undergo conformational transitions and so therefore effect a change in the resonant condition which is monitored by looking at the transmission wavelength at these ports, port two or port three. So therefore, one can have a, a four port coupler switch, right, which one can use for device applications. So what we've done here in collaboration with the group at Harvard, we also introduce a blue light beam which truncates the BR photocycle at the M state. So one can, you know, have a faster switching time with that, with a with an additional blue film. So these, these are the results which you sh can see the resonance shift when you have alternate green and pump, green and blue beams on and you can see that the switching response of the near infrared wavelength can be affected uh, by this kind of a switch. There's more, what to say, transmission or a contrast with the tra transverse electric mode rather than the TM mode and as soon as the blue light comes in, it triggers a faster switching back to the initial state. So this four port resonant coupler is a very elegant scheme for designing different kinds of computing circuits. So you have this BR protein, the purple membrane, you have a control signal, that's the 570 green yellow wavelength, and you have the near infrared wavelength which passes through the fiber, which you can control whether it passes and goes, couples to port three or passes through port two. So this is the truth table diagram, and using three micro cavities and the control signal, you can implement a half adder subtractor, an all optical half adder subtractor. So you have the carry, the sum difference, and the borrow port here, and depending upon whether this gets switched here or it gets switched here, so depending upon the control signals, according to this truth table, you have an implementation of a half adder and a subtractor. This is the implementation for a full adder subtractor using six micro cavities, a demultiplexer circuit, so uh, different signals can be split into these output ports. Similarly, they can be multiplexed if they are coming from in here, and depending upon the select lines, one can have, because we're talking about infrared wavelength, that is 1310 nanometers or 1550 nanometers, communication wavelength. So therefore, these circuits are important for communication as well. This is an implementation of an all optical arithmetic unit using, you know, those same micro cavities. And we have a very interesting proposition, and that is, can you design conservative and reversible logic with this as a building block? So a very important uh, logic gate which has been proposed is the Fredkin gate, a universal gate, which is a, a controlled swap gate with this truth table. And there have been several, uh, you know, strategies which has been reported in the literature for the design of an efficient Fredkin gate. But this simple microresonator structure implements the all optical Fredkin gate. So this we've reported recently in uh, optical engineering and this got selected for the virtual journal of biophysics and virtual journal of nanoscience and technology. So you have very simple implementation and very efficient low power all optical Fredkin gate implementation by just one micro cavity. Similarly, with a single micro cavity, one can implement the Feynman gate, the Toffoli gate with two cavities, the Perez gate with two with different strategies, whether you use a wavelength converter or not. Similarly, the Feynman double gate, the new gate, this is the structure of an all optical reconfigurable logic unit. This is the schematic and the architecture. So you can see that with four, seven micro cavities and using these configurable nodes, you can design different kinds of logic operations. So adders or XNOR, et cetera. So these different logic operations can be designed with the same reconfigurable. You can reconfigure the circuit, the same circuit. This is the implementation of a half adder, full adder circuit with the uh, reconfigurable unit. So to conclude, there are optimized conditions uh, which have to be looked into with respect to the different parameters of the protein. And of course, it deals with concentration, the pulse width, and you can control different aspects of switching characteristics with probe wavelength or rate constants or probe intensity or pump pulse frequency as we showed. There's a, of course a trade-off between switching time and power, and you can have high contrast 
And you can use the spectral overlap of the excited states with the ground state for advantages operations in certain cases. There is prospect of ultra fast operations if you access the early intermediate states because that's sub picosecond time scale when the protein responds. These, this is a, it, in fact, this study of these initial intermediate states is a very hot area in molecular biology and chemistry because people want to know what is the signal transduction pathway. And there have been different models and different strategies which people have proposed, and it is still not clear, but the fact is that uh, there is scope here to exploit for ultra-fast operations. So to conclude, all optical computing circuits using ultra-high sensitivity of BR and microresonators gives you a very unique proposition for designing computing circuits. You have potential advantages in terms of simplicity, low power operation. This uh, switching which we performed was less than a microwatt. Fast operation, tunability, compactness. You can design, these designs which we proposed are, proposed are general. They can be implemented with photonic crystals on a, on a planar geometry. Flexibility in cascading 2D, 3D architectures. And you can easily implement both Boolean and reversible logic. You can reconfigure and you can have multiple wavelength operation by you know, even exploiting the polarization states. And of course, it could lead to a cost effective proposition. So this leads to a new paradigm for hybrid nanobiophotonic integration so that you can enhance the biofunctionality by integrating it with uh, these kind of nanostructures. So it could lead to a prospective technology. So I would like to acknowledge my PhD students, past and present, MPhil MSc students who've done excellent work, and our collaborators, Frank Walmert at Harvard, where we did the experiments uh, along with him, and Yura Topolancic and Northeastern, we have been collaborating on these different proteins with a Japanese group at Hokkaido and Osaka. And of course, Professor Deepak Mathur at TIFR Bombay and Aditya at TIFR with the initial BR experiments and Professor Reddy at IIT Bangalore. Of course, the funding agencies. Thank you very much for your kind attention. A few questions. Sir, how can we still compare the photonic integrated circuits with the silicon integrated circuits where we are working at the operating frequency in gigahertz and the delay we can't afford more than 10 to 20 nanoseconds. The fact is that we are looking at breakthroughs for future technologies. You see, silicon switching, TTL circuit switch in nanoseconds. What we have shown here is of the order of microseconds. The fact is that at the moment, the entire thrust is on silicon, of course, because we are pursuing electronics. But the fact is that one has to look for future opportunities. So that's how it's, it's at the, what to say, at a research level, one has to see whether one can exceed that or even match that. So at the moment, photonic circuits have their advantages. But as far as the switching circuits, which we are talking about, right, they are functional at microsecond. But I showed you some uh, other proteins which had switching response uh, at the level of nanoseconds as well. Nanoseconds. Yeah. But another important point is we can have femtosecond switching, picosecond switching with proteins and organic materials. But then the laser intensities go high. You have to use high intensity. So our objective had been to make a compromise between power and switching speed or time. So that one can have an optimum you know, uh, what to say, implementation. So if I'm using microwatt or sub-microwatt power levels here, right, and the energy switching uh, energy per bit is about nanojoules per bit for this protein. But uh, the fact is that it is again a subject of research and one has to see whether one can, you know, enhance the functionality further. So, but the, but the point is, at the moment, you can't really compare with silicon switching circuits as such because they are at an advanced stage, all right? But there are, of course, for example, you're talking about quantum computing, so it's much into the future. But we are trying to, you know, provide breakthroughs uh, in computing technology. 